Good morning, dear sisters and brothers in Christ. It is a joy and an honor to be with you because I heard of your great faith. I heard of your great love of the Lord through Brother Brian Long. Brother Brian Long is a personal friend of mine and we have ministered together. And so it's a joy and an honor to meet you all and to benefit from your love, from your prayers, uh, from your faith. And I'm so grateful that God has also placed me with uh, uh, one of your dear leaders uh, and uh, Brother Sam and his dear wife. They have been taking care of me so very well, and I'm so grateful for their love. For uh, I'm also grateful to your other elders, to uh, Brother JP, Brother Levi, and uh, all of you, I honor you because you pray. And without prayer, there is no ministry. Thank you for those that were able to come last night. And you heard uh, perhaps the first part of a testimony where God allowed me to remain alive. Uh, Six times uh, I should have been killed, and I was not killed. It was in total 11 times where God protected me and allowed me not to be killed. I would have gone to an eternity of hell if I had died. And so I'm so grateful to him that he's so kind and gracious to look upon each one of us and to draw us unto himself. Now, uh, this message is called Personal Revival Part 2. And Andrew Bonner said, Revival begins... Uh, with God's own people, the Holy Spirit touches their hearts anew and gives them new fervor and compassion and zeal, new light and life. And when he has thus come to you, he next goes forth to the valley of dry bones because there are valleys of dry bones all around us. And he needs people alighted with fire And I love the songs that you sang today, Praise God, Praise God, where you pray for revival, where you sing for revival, where your thoughts are to be revived and to be used of God. So there must be personal revival before there is corporate revival. Evan Roberts from the Great Welsh Revival gave four points for personal revival. And uh, number one is confess before God every sin in your past life that has not been confessed. Confess every sin in your past life that has not been confessed. Number two, we must remove anything that is doubtful in our lives. Anything where you have a question Should this be of God? Should I be doing this? Just don't do it. Don't argue about it. Don't think about it. Let the Holy Spirit guide you. Stay away from questionable things. Number three is total surrender. We must say and do what the Holy Spirit tells us to do. The fourth point, make a public confession of Christ. So allow me to share how God helped me after becoming a Christian, after my new life started, and perhaps some of these things will help you as well. And so uh, last night I shared that uh, I was uh, actually saved in New Jersey. I had come home from Europe, and I had run a major corporation there. And one morning, on a Saturday morning, Uh, I was in a vision of an open grave, and I was lying in this grave, all bound with my sins from head to toe, and I couldn't move, and I said, what am I doing here? I must get out of this grave. And I couldn't get out, and I called for help, and no one came, but I knew that Christ Jesus was the way. And then after a long time of calling for others first, I had the vision that I was headed for hell, for eternity, forever and ever. And then I changed my call to the Lord Jesus Christ, and I said, is there any hope for a sinner like me? Is there any mercy left for a man like me with all of its sins 
because I had left my family. I was divorced. I had left two beautiful daughters behind. I had gotten into sin, into pornography, into all kinds of evil in my life. And I should have gone to hell. But when I called for Jesus, a wonderful, wonderful thing happened. And uh, a person came to the grave and he reached into the grave. He put his hand around my head, helped me to sit up. All of my sins snapped off my body. And that moment I woke up, I had been in a vision. I had been in a dream, but I was next to my bed. And I knelt and I confessed. And I cried out and I said, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, forgive me. I repent of all of my sins. Make me new, Lord. Make me new. Make me new, Lord. Please help me, Lord. And so uh, Christ Jesus came into my life and I told him that I believed in him, that uh, I thanked him for uh, forgiving my sins, that I would believe that he was resurrected and that I would follow him from that day forward. And that is what God has allowed me to do, is to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God. And once I had become a Christian, heaven came down and glory filled my soul when at the cross the Savior made me whole. My sins were all forgiven and now I am on my way to heaven. Perhaps one or the other person here this morning has never experienced that, that great joy that comes through being right with God. And uh, later on, you'll have a chance to confess to Christ if you want to. You can taste this new life. It is incredible, beloved. It is far more exciting, far more wonderful than running a $900 million corporation, and I testify to it. There is no joy, no lasting joy in money and big business. And I can attest to that. And even as uh, Solomon wrote about this, it is all like blowing in the wind. Okay? So don't go for the money. Go for the Lord Jesus Christ, young people. Those that are here, give your life to him. Follow him. Do what he's asking you to do. So now I had accepted Christ and I wanted to follow him. And I said, now, Lord, what do I do? What do I do next? And he gave me this guiding verse, uh, John chapter 14, verse 15. John chapter 14, verse 15. It's one line only. And uh, each one of you will be able to remember it forever. It's only one line, okay? John chapter 14, verse 15. And there it says, praise God, if you love me. What? What are we supposed to do? Keep my commandments. If, if you love me. If there's a question mark there, do you truly love Jesus today? Or do you still have besetting sins in your life that you cannot overcome? Because if you truly love him and you draw close to him, he will help you. And so this is what has happened in my life. Every time I prayed uh, and I said, Lord, I love you, the answer came back. If you love me, keep my commandments. I was still in big business in New Jersey at that particular time point, shortly after I was saved, and uh, uh, I was running a number of foreign businesses at that time point, and the chairman of the company uh, uh, told me, uh, look, we are going to fly to my villa in Key Biscayne, and I want you to come, and uh, uh, we are going to review all of your businesses, and the vice chairman and I will be there in Key Biscayne. Uh, I had just uh, gotten a black cancer on my face, on the right-hand side of my face, and uh, I said uh, to him, uh, could I just check on what to do about this cancer, and do I have time to come to Florida with you? And I checked with um, specialists, and they took a biopsy, and they said yes. It is cancer, but uh, we cannot give you an appointment for the cancer to be removed 
for the next 10 days, so go ahead and go to Florida, and then we'll do the operation afterwards. And so um, uh, we were flying in the airplane to Key Biscayne, and as I was on the airplane, I was reading my Bible, and I was thinking about what would happen in Key Biscayne. You see, we used to work every Sunday. It wasn't unusual for us to work on a Sunday. And here I'm in the plane and I'm saying, Lord, what am I supposed to do? Well, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I said, but Lord, if I say no to this man, if I say no to this vice chairman, uh, they're going to let me go. I'm going to lose my job. What am I to do, Lord? And there was no answer. And so I kept on praying in the airplane. And finally I decided, okay, I'm going to speak to him. And I went over uh, uh, and uh, I said to him, uh, and he was a personal friend of mine as well, and I said, now, you know that I have become a Christian and I got to go to church on Sunday. Would that be a problem for us? We were flying on a Saturday. And so uh, he said, no, no, that's okay. You go ahead, you go to church. So uh, we arrived in Key Biscayne, uh, came Sunday morning. We had breakfast together and all of a sudden he said, now let's get ready for our business meeting. We're going to meet in a few minutes. Let's all have a shower first and then we'll meet. And I saw that all of the business papers were lined up on a large table in his villa. And so I went to my room, you know, and there was a little carpet there. And I knelt on that carpet and I said, now, Lord, what am I supposed to do? And there was no answer. You see, if it's already written in the word of God, you don't need a special answer, do you? It's already there. And so I prayed and I prayed and I said, Lord, uh, uh, maybe I can take another day as a day of rest. And that's a good way out, Lord. So maybe I should do that, but I had no peace about that. And so finally, uh, I came uh, out of that room. I had to change my shirt. I had sweat through one shirt. Now I had put on another shirt. And I came out and I saw them both sitting there. And I said, uh, Chairman, uh, I really have to go to church this morning, and I'm sorry about the meeting, but we need to have the meeting tomorrow. We can catch up tomorrow. And the vice chairman looked at me and he said, sort of, if you leave this moment, you will be fired. We're sitting here waiting to have a meeting, and you will be fired. And I turned to the chairman, I said to the chairman, I had asked you yesterday uh, whether we could have uh, 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 the time to go to church, whether I could go to church, and you had said yes. And I said, I really uh, appreciate the company I'm working for, but I must go and serve my God. And the vice chairman turned to the chairman and said, you see, you see, you're not number one in the world after all. You're only second after God. And so I walked to the door, and as I came to the door and to open the door, uh, the vice chairman shouted behind me, if you touch that doorknob, you're fired, you're done. And, you know, uh, I had just become a Christian, and I had met some missionaries, and I was supporting missionaries, and I didn't know what would happen if I lost that job. But I looked at my hand and I said, Satan, I used to belong to you. No more. No more. I now belong to Christ, and I will follow Christ, whatever the cost is. You see, I can go to church all of my life and listen to good sermons, but if I don't do the word of God, am I truly a born-again Christian? Am I truly following Jesus? And so I turned that knob, I walked out, I got to a church in Key Biscayne, had never there been before, all old people in the 
uh, congregation, the pastor sort of gave a very dry sermon. And I was sitting there, and uh, uh, as I was uh, 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 sitting and listening to the sermon, all of a sudden there was a voice behind me. And the voice said, I have healed you. And I looked around, and there were only old people sitting behind me, and I couldn't understand uh, what was happening. And was it really God that spoke? Uh, I checked the side of my face. The cancer was still there. So I went back to the villa, and I said to the uh, chairman, I think God has healed me. But on the way back and after the meetings in the airplane, I was praying, and I said, Lord, I thought I heard your voice, but why am I not healed? And the answer came back, if you love me, keep my commandments. And you see, I had gotten saved in the midst of great sin. And I was still living common law with a woman. I had promised to marry her. I had been divorced uh, prior to becoming a Christian. And I promised this woman to marry her. And uh, so uh, after uh, the Lord said, if you love me, keep my commandments, I was reading my Bible and I came to Matthew chapter 7. And there Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, if you get married again, for me it's adultery. And so I was confused because I have heard of pastors who have used 1 Corinthians as a way out that you can get married again. And some of you might be married again, but uh, please, God is able to forgive you for that as well. But I had a choice to make. Should I go against God now? Or should I follow his voice? If you love me, keep my commandments. And so when I got off the airplane, I was all upset. I didn't know what to do. I called up a local pastor uh, who was also a friend of mine at that time point. And I asked him, and he said, no, I read the scriptures the same way you do. You cannot get married again. I said, what do I do? He said, well, you better call her up right now. And so I called her up, beloved, and I listened to six hours of pain. You see, when you hurt when you kill expectations, when things occur like this, it causes great, great pain. And I said to her, I'm truly sorry, but I have become a Christian. I have to do what the Word of God says, because am I truly a Christian if I don't do what the Word of God says? Am I a Christian, Lord? And so I terminated that relationship that day. The next morning I was washing in the sink, uh, and uh, as I looked in the sink, there appeared this black uh, little animal about this size in the sink. I was wondering, was it something that had come through the piping? Uh, and I didn't know. It seemed to be glistening and moving a little bit, but it wasn't an animal, beloved. And when I looked in the mirror, the cancer had fallen off my face. It was in the sink. You see, God says, if you love me, keep my commandments. I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. But I want you to follow me. I want you to do my will. I want you to do what my word says. Will you do it? Will you do it? I then had another great problem, and that was one of lying. You see, when you uh, uh, live with, with your family and uh, it breaks apart, there are many, many lies, and I became a compulsive liar. And then also in big business, uh, you always look for an advantage, and you often say things that are not quite truthful. Uh, children, it's called lying, okay? People say they're white lies, but they are lies. It's called lying. And God doesn't want us to lie. If you love me, keep my commandments. And so I cried out to God, and I said, God, I cannot stop. I cannot stop this. 
I catch myself ever so often and I say something and I don't know where it's coming from, but all of a sudden I say something that isn't truth. I don't want that. I want to follow you. I want to follow you. I want to love you. I want to do your will. And so one day I came to Isaiah chapter 6, verse 5. And there Isaiah came before the throne of God and he cried out, Whoa! Woe is unto me, a man of unclean lips. Oh Lord, oh Lord, I can't stop, I need your help. And God in his mercy sent a cherubim with a hot coal that he placed in his mouth to cleanse him anew. And I said, and I prayed, Lord, Lord, he was a prophet, I, I am just a... Sinner saved by grace, there's nothing special about me, but would you help me to not, not lie anymore? Would you help me? And then three days later, beloved, I didn't have to lie anymore. Uh, nothing seemed to have touched me, but God answered my prayer. I didn't have to lie anymore. So I can tell you the truth today, and what you hear is truth. Praise God. And then uh, came the next step for me, and I had shared last night that I was misused uh, as a child uh, at the age of 10. I was sexually misused, and that had affected my whole life for 52 years. I didn't trust anyone. I rejected people. I kept distance, and it was a horrible life because uh, I was trying to protect myself and I thought I had a white castle on the inside where I was safe. But it was an old prison from Satan where only Satan had access to me. And so I got into all kinds of evil. And I have mentioned some of these evils already. And it uh, had grown in the past. And now, now I, I, I came to a point where uh, uh, this was still an opening for the evil one because I had not forgiven. And so in, in uh, Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, it says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But, but if you do not forgive man their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. Oh, this was so hard, wasn't it? How can you forgive people that hurt you so much? Perhaps some of you are here that have been hurt greatly, but are you willing to do the word of God? Are you willing to do what God tells you to do? You say, no, 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 I cannot do that. That man doesn't deserve forgiveness. Or a man might say that woman doesn't, for, uh, she doesn't deserve forgiveness. She won't get it from me. No, I won't do it. In Matthew chapter 18, God says he will turn you over to the torturer. And the torturer is bitterness in your life. You become sour. You become unforgiving. You, you don't have higher help in your relationship. You have sleeplessness. You get ulcers. And perhaps all kinds of other things uh, come. A feeling of overwhelming fear or feeling uh, going out of control. A feeling of great danger. A feeling uh, of gloom and urgency to escape. All kinds of things might happen in your life because you're going against God. And so I had to face that and say, okay, Lord, if I have to forgive, I will forgive. And then I forgave, and beloved, uh, I got a phone call from Europe uh, two days later that the person that had misused me just died. And uh, that was about uh, 3,000 kilometers away. And the person that had taken care of this person that had misused me said that this person had lived with guilt all of their life, but somehow knew just before that person went into eternity 
that they were forgiven. How, I don't know, but they knew they were forgiven. Beloved, are you willing to follow not only a good sermon, but will you take action in your Christian life and do this word of God for you to be released from anger, from heaviness of your heart, because you've been hurt and you haven't been able to forgive, the Lord will help you. The Lord will help you. But you must do it, because if you don't, then you're not right with God. It is sin. It is sin in your life. And then you open yourself up to the evil one to be attacked through him. I had uh, uh, recently uh, a young woman that uh, tried to commit suicide uh, six times. She was cutting herself, she was taking pills, she totaled a car, and uh, uh, she had to forgive people that had hurt her greatly. And then she had demonic uh, possession, she heard voices, and uh, she really, really tried to kill herself. And uh, then she was willing to follow God and do what God had said to do in his word. And part of that was that she had to forgive people that had hurt her. I mentioned yesterday that even if you're sexually misused, that is the old body. You are born again. You're righteous before God when you're born again. There is a new person inside of you. The old flesh will fall off. You will receive a new, clean, wonderful body from heaven, praise God. And so uh, forgive, forgive, let God deal with the issues on whatever happened to you. Let God deal with it because God says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. Let him repay. Don't you worry about that. You do what the Bible says and you do what the word of God says. And so praise God. The next step for me was uh, another verse that I came across in Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 to 24. And there it says, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, what am I to do? Tell me. Help me. Help me. Help me. Tell me. Tell me. Tell me. Tell me what to do. Tell me what the Bible says. Leave your gift at the altar and be what? Be reconciled. Be reconciled. And so have you hurt people in your life? And then have you made things right with those people that you have hurt? You know, I was wrestling with this verse so much when I came across it. I didn't know what to do. And I said, Jesus, what am I supposed to do? I have hurt so many people. I have hurt my former wife. I have hurt uh, this woman that I used to live common law with. I have hurt my daughters. My daughters, by the way, prayed for me for 18 years that God would have mercy on me. So kids, don't give up praying for your parents if they don't believe. Don't give up, okay? Because God is able. But here was a situation where I was supposed to reach out. And then Satan came and he says, well, no one else is doing that. Why do you want to do that? Why do you want to do that? If you love me, keep my commandments, says Jesus. If you love me, keep my commandments. Be reconciled. And so I called up my, uh, my first wife, and she had gotten married again. And uh, I said uh, uh, to her and to her husband, because now her new husband was the shield over her, and so I wanted him to be there. And I said uh, to them, I have become a Christian, and the Bible tells me that I need to ask for forgiveness. Would you allow me to meet with you and ask for your forgiveness for the things that I have done. And so I went and I listened to eight hours 
of pain. Eight hours of pain. Young people, don't go there, okay? It's not worth it. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. Do what Jesus tells you to do, okay? And if you're now married and you don't have a good marriage, both of you go to the Lord. Both of you die to your old self and be reconciled. Don't go the divorce route, okay? It's hell. I try to commit suicide. And uh, yet God, God preserved my life. God wouldn't let me die. Praise God. So here I asked my wife and um, she wasn't able to forgive me. But you see, it's okay as long as we do our part, whether the other party can forgive us or not, is up to them, between them and God. And I called up the uh, woman that I had lived common law with and I asked her for forgiveness. I called up my two daughters. Uh, they had gotten married in the meantime. And uh, uh, I asked for a meeting with them. And uh, the problem is, uh, beloved, and children too, if, you, yeah, if you're here and your mom and dad don't get along, it's not your fault, okay? It's not your fault. It's their sin. So because what children uh, take from that is that somehow they can stop the fighting between you two, that they somehow can intervene, and that if you don't make it, then the children say, I am at fault. I'm dealing now with uh, several people that were told as children that they had caused the breakdown of their parents. And guess what? They are in deep, deep depression. Satan has found an opening into their lives. And that must be stopped. The lies must stop, beloved. The lies must stop. And we must do what the Word of God tells us. So I called up my, my older daughter and I said, Daughter, please let me ask you for forgiveness, but please bring your husband because you are under his headship. And so they both came. And we, uh, my, my daughter was sitting six feet away from me on a long couch. My son-in-law was sitting across from me. And I said to them, you know, I have become a Christian and I cannot make good all of the evil that I have done. But the Bible tells me that I must ask you for forgiveness. I must ask you for forgiveness. And I said to her, Suzanne, you're not at fault with what happened between your mom and dad. You never... Uh, could have stopped that. There was sin in my life. And she looked at me and she moved on the couch a little bit closer. And I said to her, would you forgive me for abandoning you at an early age? And she said, yes, Dad, I forgive you. And she came a little bit closer. And then I said to her, can you forgive me for all of my criticism that I levied against you? And she said, yes, Dad, I forgive you. And she came a little bit closer. I said, I was so judgmental, judging you always, but never judging myself. Will you forgive your dad? And she said, yes, Dad, I forgive you. And then I said to her, daughter, I always looked at myself first, not you. Will you forgive your dad for selfishness? And she said, yes, I forgive you, dad. And she came a little bit closer. Will you forgive me for being proud, not patient, having a lack of self-control, not allowing communication with you? Will, will you forgive me, daughter? And she came a little bit closer. And then I... Something had happened to me at the age of 10. When my daughters turned 10, I could not hug them anymore. 
and I didn't know why. And it was uh, at the age of 62 that I found out what had happened. What had happened to me at the age of 10 was a fear inside of me that if I touched my daughters, I would do to them what was done to me. And I said, Suzanne, at the age of 10, I couldn't hold you anymore. I couldn't love you anymore. I couldn't hug you anymore. But it wasn't you. It wasn't even me. It was sin in my life. And I could not hug you anymore. Will you forgive me, daughter? And she came into my arms and we wept and we cried. But God is able to undo things. God is able to undo things. God is able to take the canker worm away. And then a similar thing happened with my younger daughter. And I was forgiven by my daughters, praise God. And then another day I came across another passage in Luke chapter 19, verses 8 and 9. Luke chapter 19, verses 8 and 9, and there it says, Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to them, Today salvation has come to this house, because he is also uh, repentant and, and a son of Israel. And so, beloved, Zacchaeus had to do right with things that he had done wrong. And when I looked at that verse, I realized in the power positions that I had, I had taken things that didn't belong to me. That's called stealing, children. That's called stealing. And it's wrong in accordance with the Lord. And so uh, the corporations that I had been with, uh, uh, where that had taken place at that particular time point, I was no longer with them. So I made a donation, uh, even as Zacchaeus uh, did, and uh, made a donation uh, to the poor. But also uh, I was reminded that I really had hurt my wife so much, and I had taken away from her part of her livelihood, and so I gave her the half that I was entitled to under the divorce. I gave it to her, and then I had um, uh, saved for a retirement home uh, to be with that woman that I had lived common law with, and so I gave her the home to make things right. Don't look at me that I'm somehow good, okay? I was just trying to do the word of God. Do you understand? It's God. It's God in us. It is his love, his mercy that he will show through us if we are saved. It's no longer about us. It's about him that his love would shine through us and show a different path from the things that the world is taking, beloved. And then I came to the next step, and uh, the next step is surrendering fully to God and removing every doubtful habit. And in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. So now I, I was wrestling with this because before when I ran things, it was always my will, my direction. You do what I tell you. If you don't, there are consequences. And now all of a sudden I was in a dilemma because God said, no, 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 it's my will now and your obedience it's my will and your obedience. It's my power, God said, and it's your dependence now. Because you cannot do these things that I was talking about without higher help, okay? I must remain connected to God. I cannot do the things uh, that are right 
before God without his help. And he's so willing to help you because Jesus wants to be with you all the time. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Praise God. And so we had to start walking by faith and believing God. And so also uh, along the way, uh, uh, we then gave all away in dependence upon God. We gave things away. That is not for everybody, but this is what God moved me to do, that I would give everything to the poor so that he could then direct my life the way he wanted to. And I took away riches and resources so that I might follow the Lord Jesus in total dependence upon him only. That's a hard step, beloved, and only if God leads you that way. He doesn't do that with everyone, and if he uses your resources wisely and for his glory, that might not be for you, but for me it was, and so I did, and I obeyed. I obeyed God in what he told me to. Then on April 8th, 2005, the Lord called me into full-time Christian service, and uh, he, uh, he used a verse in 1 Samuel 10, 6, and he said, Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you, and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. This was actually a verse that was used for King Saul. And when this verse came to me, I said, No, God, no, 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 no. I don't want to be like King Saul, turn back from you afterwards. I don't want to do that. Don't give me that verse. Don't call me like that. And then he gave me a follow-up verse from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 15. And the follow-up verse was, But my mercy shall not depart from him as I took it from Saul. And that was a promise that was given to King David for his son Solomon. Now you know that Solomon wasn't perfect, right? But God promised he would not take his grace, his mercy, from Solomon. And so God gave me that follow-up verse, and it reminded me of the evils that I had been in. And yet God was so willing to forgive, so gracious, so kind, so loving. And so it was uh, incredible that he would want to do that, but then I did not want to follow him. I said, Lord, I'm too evil. No one is going to listen to me. No one wants to hear, you know, about divorces and evil and things. And God said, yes, but you got to tell them. I'll straighten it out. I'll make you well. And he'll do the same for you. You see, I'm not, I'm not just an exception. God wants to do that for all of you. God wants to help all of you in whatever situation you're in. But if you love him, he requires something. He requires something. If you truly love him, then do. Don't just read the word. Don't just listen to the word, but do the word. And then uh, the last point, and that was also a point, uh, of course, that I mentioned earlier. Uh, I had to go uh, uh, to where I could be used by God. But I wasn't willing to do it initially, and uh, I was meeting with a missionary uh, uh, leader in the car every Thursday afternoon. We were... Uh, holding each other accountable before the Lord, that there would no, be no impurity. We were holding each other accountable, and we prayed. We prayed about being used of God. And so this one day, he started shouting at me. He said, you must do the work of God. You're called. And I said, wait a minute, brother. You know, just, just settle down. You're a Christian. You don't need to get so excited, you know. <laughs> But, but he said, no, you've got to do what God has called you to do. You're called for revival. That was in 2008, okay? And I, I didn't want to do this work, to be honest with you. I just don't feel worthy. I don't feel that, 
that God could use a person like me. And so uh, I said, okay, uh, okay, I said to my brother, I will pray about it, think about it. I went back to my condominium in the afternoon and uh, I said, well, I have no connections. Uh, I'm not connected anywhere. What do I do? And uh, I entered the word revival on the computer. A screen comes up, Wall Street Revival, New York, Pastor Bruce Berliner. And I said, Lord, am I supposed to contact this man? And there was no answer. So I said, okay, well, I don't know what to do, Lord. I had a man's prayer breakfast the following morning, Friday morning, in Wayne, New Jersey, 40 miles from New York. And I went to that prayer breakfast, and uh, I like to sit in the back uh, <laughs> out of trouble. And uh, there was a big round table in the back. One man was sitting there, and I said, good morning. Uh, and he said to me, good morning, pastor. And I got angry, uh, and I said, no, 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 I'm not a pastor. And then he said to me, and he looked at me, and he said, well, I think God has called you. Maybe you don't know it, but you're called of God, and you've got to do what God has called you to do. And I got, I got more angry then, because in business, sometimes people used come-ons, you know. And so uh, I said to him, sort of in a testy voice, and who might you be? And he said, my name is Pastor Bruce Ber Berliner from Wall Street Revival, New York. And I nearly fell off my chair. I got afraid of God, didn't know what to do. And this man keeps on talking. I, I haven't got the heart to tell him uh, what is happening with me. And so I said to him, uh, uh, so tell me about yourself. And he said, well, I have two churches and I also preach where uh, 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 Lampierre used to preach in revival in New York. And so, uh, beloved, uh, 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 he then said to me, uh, the Holy Spirit got me out of bed this morning at around 4.30 a.m. to come to this prayer meeting. And I don't want to be here, and I don't know why I'm here. I have two funerals this morning, and I, I don't know why I'm here. And the more he talked, the more scared I became of God, okay? But then I knew I needed to do. Now the last point, because our time has gone quickly, the last point that I wanted to mention is to go public with your witness, to go public with your witness. Acts 1.8 says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. If you come to me afterwards and say, brother, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, I'm going to answer you, I praise God with you. But tell me, when is the last time you have spoken to someone about Jesus? When is the last time? Are you willing to do what God calls you to do? I had another dream, and uh, I was running a, a Japanese company in Japan, and I had a dream, and in the dream was that I was to get a Bible for one of the presidents of a Japanese company, uh, this president reported half to a conglomerate in Japan, and the other half reporting was to me. And uh, I'm going to give him a different name for security reasons, uh, Mr. Hamamoto. I was to get him a Bible, and I said, no, no, Lord, I cannot do that. I have not witnessed, and, and I don't know what to do. And uh, this man might be into Shintoism or D Buddhism. I cannot bring him a Bible when I go on business there to a board meeting. And uh, the Lord wouldn't let me sleep for three nights. And then I had to give in. And I ordered a Japanese Bible from the uh, 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 Bible Society in the United States. The Bible came. I told my secretary to wrap up the Bible and to wrap up some socks and ties for the other board members. On the way to Japan in the airplane, I was pleading with God for eight hours. And I said, now, Lord, you have to be reasonable. I'm supporting a number of missionaries, and, and uh, I cannot be fired over this, okay? So you have to be reasonable. And the Lord wouldn't answer me. 
And then finally I said, now, Lord, I have a good proposition for you uh, to deal with this. And the proposition is this. When all of the other board members open up their presence, let Mr. Hamamoto not open up his presence in front of everyone, but let him go to his office and let him open up his Bible there. Now, I think God must have been smiling at this man in the airplane, okay? I get to the board meeting, and all of the board members are there from a major corporation. Mr. Hamamoto is there. I pass out the presence. Uh, Mr. Hamamoto is the first one who, who uh, rips off uh, the, uh, the paper of his Bible. And, you know, Japanese are very conservative, right? But this man, a Bible, a Bible, a Bible, a Bible. And all of the other board members were embarrassed. And, beloved, I was embarrassed too, okay? I was ready to crawl into the ground, and I didn't know what had happened. And so um, I said to Mr. Hamamoto afterwards, and God has forgiven me for being embarrassed, by the way, because if I'm embarrassed giving the gospel, he'll be embarrassed when we stand before the Father, okay? But God has forgiven me for that. But I talked to Mr. Hamamoto. I said, the next time I come to Japan, will you tell me what happened? And three months later, we took a bullet train to Kyoto, and on the way, he told me his story. He said, I have a little tea garden in Japan. There is a lantern, a stone lantern in the tea garden. And one day, when I was walking through my garden, uh, I, I uh, dropped something near that stone lantern, and when I bent down, I saw at the very uh, bottom of the stone lantern a little cross etched in. And he said, I didn't know what it was. I didn't know uh, what had happened. And so he said, uh, he then became very interested, and he was able to go back to the 16th century with his forefathers, and he found that part of his forefathers had been Christians. They were actually executed. They were executed. And then he said, uh, uh, one day he walked through his garden. There was a blue sky. He pointed at the sky. And uh, he said, now, Christian God, if you're real, I want to know if you're real. Send me a sign. Send me a sign, Christian God. And then he said, a few days later, a man arrived from America and presented to him the word of God. And he said, I knew this was the sign from God, that God is real, that God is alive, beloved. In closing, I was talking with uh, three Muslim men and told them about the gospel. And... Uh, They said to me, now you Christian people, you live evil. How can you tell me about all of the things that God has done in your life and you believe, ask me to believe that it's real? And so I said to him, well, I have a testimony for you. It's not a testimony from me, but it's a testimony from my daughters, okay? And I'll just read you a short paragraph from a letter that was written to me actually by both daughters. And in this letter it says, and it was signed by uh, my older daughter, her husband, and two grandchildren. And they, they said, we are remembering all that God has done in your life, Dad, and in mine too. Just this morning I had a dream. In my dream I was visiting some sort of gathering in a scummy part of town with druggies and people who were really messed up. Uh, it was interesting because some guy uh, got up and sort of said, well, God sure has done things in my life. Guess what? The Holy Spirit came on me in the dream, and I got up and I started to testify about the great greatness of God in my life, what God has done in my life to help me to forgive, to help me to start this life, uh, which was so messed up at the beginning. And then she said, uh, you were uh, there at that meeting. You were going to be speaking to everyone. And I started to call you daddy. I started to call you daddy and talking to everyone about what God has done in your life 
how he has changed you, how you're a new creation, how that doesn't mean you don't sometimes mess up, but that you're new and God did it. God did it. This is not a story about me, beloved. You hear my name, but it's God. It's God. He can do it for each one of you, for each one of you.